Hello, everybody, and welcome to Psychedelic Seminars. If you can see me, uh, please chime in on the chat to make sure everything is coming through correctly and clearly. Um, my name is Mike Margulies. I am the founder of Psychedelic Seminars, and um, really great to have you all here today. Um, it's definitely been a, a very <laughs> tragically, actually, um, more timely than uh, originally intended event here. Um, uh, myself and uh, Liana, who is initially going to be our moderator, have both uh, experienced personal loss, um, for in my case, a couple of personal losses in the last um, week and a half or so. Um, and so before we get into the, the programming here, I just do want to take a moment to, um, to dedicate this event uh, and to make some acknowledgements. Um, I would personally like to dedicate this event to two friends I lost in the most in the recent weeks, uh, to Django Atkinson and to Sean McCabe, uh, two close friends of mine who I lost very recently. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge losses in the psychedelic community more broadly. Uh, we lost this year Kalindi Ee and James O'Rock, and um, that has been a big theme this year in general. Uh, of course, with COVID, um, there is a lot of death. There's a lot of uh, processing, a lot of grief. Um, so this event is, uh, you know, as I said, it's a lot more timely than we uh, ever intended. Um, and I'd like to, you know, on that note, uh, I know m many of you who are tuning in today. I'm sure have experienced loss yourselves, and I'd love to give everyone here the opportunity um, in the chat, you know, to call in anyone who you would like to acknowledge and dedicate for yourself uh, this event to. So please feel free in the chat to name anybody who you would like to name and acknowledge um, who you've lost. And um, yeah, I'm just going to take a moment of silence uh, for the loss here. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Liana may be joining us later and tagging in. Uh, we will see how things go. Um, these uh, recent events have disrupted a lot of our plans. Um, that's also part of how life goes, I suppose. Um, so um, I will be uh, filling in for Liana for the role of uh, moderator today. And I would love for um, these great folks here to introduce themselves. Actually, some backstory. Um, the four of us all um, connected earlier this year um, at an event on the same subject, a very small conference in the Headlands on psychedelics and palliative care uh, and the, that the four of us actually all attended. And so in some way, that event um, is what led to this event. And so, um, you know, pretty much appreciation for the folks at the Headlands um, for organizing that event. Um, and leading to this today. Um, love to allow each of you to introduce yourselves in your own words. We can do it sort of popcorn style, whoever would like to chime in. <laughs> Tony's pointing, so he's... <laughs> All right, how about Maria? Okay, um, well, my name is Maria Mangini. Uh, my uh, day job, I guess, is that I'm a family nurse midwife. Um, like many midwives, uh, the interest in birth uh, has transmuted as I've aged and gotten closer to the end of my life into an interest in death. And um, it's an interesting thing to discover that the same behaviors and skills that really seem to be useful around the environment of birth seem also to be useful around the environment of death as well. The, the capacity to be present with someone who's in pain and still have your heart open. The ability not to have somebody else's anxiety become your anxiety. These are all useful things. Thanks, Maria. And 
I'll go ahead. Uh, my name is Lady Bird Morgan, and I'm currently the director of the Humane Prison Hospice Project, uh, where we are focusing on getting hospice programs into prisons. And my other hat and roles have been as a nurse and a social worker, mostly working in end of life, palliative care, and some trauma work, sexual violence. And um, I've been pulled into this conversation and this merging of worlds because my work with psychedelics absolutely um, matches with the, the desire to open up fields of possibility for people who are experiencing suffering, confusion, anything that um, is calling for a broader base to actually find a pathway forward. Um, and end of life and palliative care is a perfect matching for that work. So I'm just delighted that this is happening. And I'm Tony Bach. Um, I'm a doctor in Seattle um, at the University of Washington, a medical oncologist and palliative medicine um, specialist, and um, a longtime uh, Zen person who teaches um, with Joan Halifax at Being With Dying. And I got involved in this field um, when my mother died, when I was a sophomore in college. And um, when I uh, started to come out as a gay man, um, I came out right in the beginning of the HIV epidemic. So I'm really happy to be here, especially, uh, I feel like we're at a turning point, but also this like ugh, huge complicated lesson about what it is to, to live in the presence of death with COVID. And um, I'm very moved to see all the names and um, uncle, father, abuela, granny, all those names are, are really uh, beautiful and and I think the perfect setting for this particular conversation. So thank you all for contributing that. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm really glad to be with all of you today. Um, I, you know, wish it were in better circumstances always, but you know what? This isn't a, there isn't a better group of folks I would want to discuss all this with and work through all this with uh, doing it live, as it turns out. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I also want to invite in, uh, this is going to be very informal here, right? Uh, I, I, anyone who wants to chime in, we're, we're just having a, an open conversation, open and flow here. So, um, you know, chime in if you hear something bounce off each other, ask each other questions. And, uh, you know, I, I think one thing I'd love to maybe to initiate this conversation with, and we can flow from there um, to bounce off what you were sharing, Tony, um, you know, you mentioned the loss of, of your mother and uh, surely we've all experienced loss in our personal lives. And um, if to the extent that you all are willing to, I would love to invite you to share more about your, um, you know, personal experiences working with death and what motivated you to get involved in uh, in this subject. Well, I'll start. You know, I, I, I feel like what's happening with the COVID pandemic is is it is exposing in this in this kind of cruel way all the all the realities of death in 2020 that I think we don't always see very much you know the the technological imperative the isolation um the medicalization the focus on technology all those things that actually exist the way we died even before covid recently i mean they've all just been ratcheted up to this really painful level and and yet with that what i also see is that um it's made the presence of a human at the bedside even more poignantly, you know, obvious, like how how critical that is. And and what it what is asking of us, I think, is, you know, how present can we be for each other in this, you know, hugely complicated time, you know, wrenching because of the politics, scary because of the uncertainty, you know, frightening because of you know, every one of us is vulnerable. And yet I think it, it's like exposing for us um, what death is like now and and asking us, you know, what we should do to make this different or make this better um, if we don't think it's okay, right? And, and what I'm hearing from, you know, people that I talk to in studies and in the clinic is that it's not okay. You know, I just did a, a series of focus groups with regular people from all over the country about, 
you know, what they thought about COVID as a serious illness. And, you know, to a person, they were like, I don't even want to go to the hospital. I don't want to end up dying there. I don't want to die alone. I don't want, I don't want all these machines. And I think there's a way in which the medical establishment of which I am part, and uh, I am part of this process, um, we have created something that I think we need to like step back and take a big, hard look at. And, and I think the, uh, the appearance of psychedelics um, as a possibility of change and transformation um, is something that um, I want to embrace. But I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, Ada Maria or Lady Bird. Like, what are you seeing now? I, you know, Tony, I really agree with a lot of what you're saying. And I, it was interesting because right before COVID happened, there was this sort of burst of curiosity and interest in death and dying and, you know, programs like Reimagine Death and all of these different um, conversations were happening. There were cafes that were happening over the last maybe 10 years, but increasingly this conversation and this interest was happening. And yet there was still this separation of the medical world versus the spiritual world or people that wanted to talk about things and um, somehow what's happened this year is um, it's it's right in front of us it's something that we get to interact with and how psychedelics pulls into that is that when you when you're taking psychedelics or using psychedelic medicine you you go back into that merging field you're a part of everything again you're not separating it out and we've done a great job of segmenting and um siloing almost every part of medicine. I mean, now there's just specialties and specialists and it was all about the hospice workers and the hospice angels. And the truth is millions of people who don't work in hospice and palliative medicine also are skilled and have the capacity to be at the bedside because they are, because we do it. So psychedelics is not really teaching anything that we don't already know. It's just another portal to allow us to remember, oh yeah, I know how to do this. I have enough space in my body to to perceive the beauty in the world and also grieve it. And having the coronavirus right now and what it's asking us to, to um, the challenges I feel like are about, can we show up and enjoy our lives and be present, be fully as present as we can be and also take care of ourselves and not continue to keep spreading it as well. Like, can we do both? Hmm. It's the both end and psychedelics to me is all about the both end. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Maria. I, th I think there's also a massive upwelling of death anxiety that has come up because of the sense of vulnerability that people have because of the pandemic. And um, studies have said that death anxiety makes people more interventive at the end of life, um, particularly healthcare providers. The more death anxiety they themselves have, the more heroic activity they get involved in, in in people with people who are at the end of their lives. And I think that one of the things that both Tony, you and both you and Lady Bird have um, referred to is the way in which we sort of are already at a point where reevaluating the way that people die in the custody of us medical folk is um, becoming more subject to question. Now, I'm I'm a baby boomer. And I'm sure there are plenty of people listening to this podcast who are sick to death of the baby boomers, but there are a lot of them. And whatever the, the, the interest or focus of the baby boomer group has been pretty much throughout our lives, it has become a bigger social um, focus. When we were elementary school children, there was a big concern about whether enough algebra was being taught to keep up with the Russians. And when the boomers needed houses, we had a housing boom. And... Now, all of us are closer to the ends of our lives than we are to the beginning. Most of us have experienced the death of a parent or someone close to us. And I think the topic is becoming a fresh topic for that large demographic group. And it's almost certainly uh, would have become a big topic for the larger society as well. So we're at a, this is a timely moment when a lot of uh, different influences that are sort of coalescing seem to be focusing us on the same subject. Yes, yes. You know, I, I agree with that, Maria. And, and, you know, and yet one of the dynamics that I have seen so powerfully, um, even with the baby boomers, is that, you know, the the idea that there's going to be um, 
a cure, a prolongation just around the corner, that leads so many cancer patients to say, yeah, let's just keep doing the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And then what happens is, um, uh, you know, and I, I've seen this over and over again, they end up, people end up in circumstances that they really never would have intended to be in. And you can't back out. You can't just stop everything. And what that kind of decision making requires is a kind of deep connection to the presence of yourself, you know, the spiritual life that, that you have. And, you know, that is, there's kind of a poverty of that right now in our culture. I mean, you know, we're seeing it everywhere. And, and because of that, I think there is this kind of unwitting drive towards the kind of technological death that we are seeing on CNN every day, you know covered in plastic, um, pierced with tubes, um, immobilized on machines, um, air being forced into the lungs, um, and, and then doctors telling families, you know, it looks like everything is over. And the family goes, no, 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 we've got to keep, he, he's a fighter, right? She's a fighter. And boy, I, I feel like there's a way in which both um, doctors, families, and patients, and nurses have gotten kind of locked in to this kind of almost adversarial conversation about, you know, when is it when is it time to give up? So that the question about death has become, when is it time to give up? And, and you know, in these patients that I was interviewing in these focus groups, you know, they saw the default story around dying as some doctor comes into this dingy hospital conference room and says, hey, it's time to pull the plug. Or, and yikes, you know, I think that is where, what I see the possibility for psychedelics um, could move us so profoundly in a different direction that if um, people who, you know, can see mortality you know, coming down the road could have an experience that gave them an experience of interconnection with everything that allowed them to, you know, do some processing and come to terms with, you um, some of the big issues in their life that are still, um, you know, constraining them in some way or still shaping what's happening to them in ways that they don't actually really want, um, that the freeing up of that through a psychedelic uh, experience that has been carefully mentored and, and carefully integrated, right, prepared and, you know, accompanied and integrated, um, I, I think that would not only um, change the amount of anxiety and depression that people have, you know, that's been very well s measured in the studies by Roland Griffiths and Steve Ross and, you know, these recent studies that have been carefully controlled. But I think what the, what the next wave of research, um, I think, will show is that people's end of life decisions are different, the circumstances of their death are different, the level of the wake of the death and, you know, what we now document as post-traumatic stress disorder in IC families, like that will be different. And, and I think that is uh, the beginning of, you know, a cultural shift, even if only a small number of patients, you know, overall take advantage of what happens with psychedelics, because the story of what that kind of death could look like, it's just not out there and people have not experienced it. And so they don't trust it understandably when it comes to um, what's happening now. But I've talked a lot, so I'm gonna let you guys. Oh, it's fantastic. Up. I mean, it's making me think about when you talk about the medical community and so much of the conversation goes around the psychedelics and what's another modality for the person who needs to process their death or their the illness that they're living with and i we're talking about palliative medicine which isn't always you know at end of life this is of course potentially years before that and if psychedelics could actually integrate into the medical community in a way that everyone that's interested has that potential to actually expand their 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 reality of what's even possible for them i mean i think about the times i sat at the bedside of zen hospice project and you know, it, it really did depend on how broad I was when I was sitting at that bedside, how the family and the patient, what their experience was. So that person could be taking as many psychedelics as they want or have a lot of 
amazing openings. But if there isn't that integration, which you mentioned, Tony, for themselves, but also for the community around them, it's not just a magic pill that people are going to take and somehow they're going to be okay with everything. And I think that that quality that we focus, uh, focused on so much in the last, for me, I feel like my entire adult life, and I'm 49 now, which is um, somehow everything is going to be okay. That um, preparing for death means being okay with dying, or that you want to die, or that you're not attached to <laughs> trees or plants or your loved ones. That, and so I feel like the psychedelics also gives that that's spreading out that you can actually be in love with the world and let go mm. both yes. both things and happening. And if the medical community is also doing that, how amazing yes. would that be? It's not just focusing on the patient. I don't even want to use that word patient, but it's, it's, right. it's a shift for everyone. Yes. Um, psychedelics connects us to everything, right? It's not, you're not in your, your bubble. Oh my God, you're, you're, so you're reminding me of my dream, my dream, Lady Bird, which is that there would be a way for um, doctors and nurses to have their own psychedelic experiences as preparation for being with and treating and making medical decisions with people who are facing, you know, pivotal decisions. And so I, I can tell you, like, my own experience was a total game changer. I mean, I realized that you know, maybe the the work of of dying is actually uh, letting your ego dissolve and not actually reifying it, right? So I've done a lot of work with, you know, death with dignity and hastening death intentionally. And, you know, those patients are so intent on preserving everything about themselves. Like they're really like, I don't want to let any part of myself go. I need to die intact. I need to die the way I am now. And boy, my lesson from my own psychedelic work was like, that is not what's happening. And then actually we need to like show that there is a whole different way. And, and I think, of course, we are all mirroring each other. And there's evidence that you know, people who are getting treated for cancer are mirroring what their oncologists feel and know and have experienced. And so it is a cultural shift that has many, many levers to pull on. Maria, I know you're very experienced in this. Like, what's your take on this? Oh, well, I'm, I'm reflecting back to the idea of midwifery as a sort of a, you know, my familiar template for this kind of um, situation and activity, both the psychedelic space and the, um, the environment around death and dying. And it gives me a great deal of confidence because I experienced the part of the transformation of the environment around birth, where, you know, when I started out with my interest in obstetrics, we were taking the brand new wet newborn and holding him or her up by the heels and slapping him or her on the butt to get him started to, to breathe. And, you know, that that has people demanded that that Right. changed right. and that was a that was a public uh, a popular demand that that really made a profound change in the way that obstetrics was practiced and so i believe that a lot of the people who made that same um change come about in the environment around obstetrics are getting toward the end of their life now and they're going to want some changes in the way that people die um for themselves in the yeah. same way that they did that um well the baby boomers changed birth, and I'm hoping that the baby boomers are going to demand a change in the way we the way we die, right? And and you know I think this thing of that you're it, the parallel that you're bringing up about midwives is so is so interesting and and potentially powerful. Um, I, I see a comment from Red Wing Kaiser in there, who is a, who is an old friend who's like like a super midwife in this regard, and should be talking about this in, instead of me. So apologies, Red Wing. But what I can say is. This whole idea of mid being a midwife to the dying, it's a very powerful, different way of of framing this this phase of life. Like it's not, you know, the end of the treatment algorithm. <laughs> it's not the it's not the it's not the uh, anti-cancer medicine failure. It's like this is like an integral part of what we do. And and I think what death doulas do is awesome. And I just wish, that people weren't so scared of them that they wait till the very last moment. I feel like it's like hospice. You know, everyone's like, oh, I'm not ready for that yet. And 
and what we haven't educated everybody about is that like it takes time and work to get into this you know that old thing of oh just let go of everything it's it's way not that simple like you need you need a mentored experience and and support and people who know the way um to be able to do that kind of work and and i think psychedelics um provide a kind of another way to relax all the guarding that we are holding right to allow you to experience some of your old stuff in a new way and to you know kind of create those new pathways in your own mind that would enable any of us to open up to to that experience of 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 dying and of of living right up until the very last minute. I mean, I think what I what I see over and over that I wish more that was more in the media is there are so many people who are, you know, by conventional standards, super sick, but they're living up a storm in the way they can do it right up until the very minute um, that they that they leave this earth, and um, it's actually awesome and beautiful and and life-giving to be in the presence of them and and you know there's stories about that of like you know the one that michael Pollan documented about the the guy who took psychedelics and then later was in the mount sinai you know palliative care unit in new york and everyone wanted to come and visit him right um you know there there that that does happen and and you know could we create the conditions for people to experience that um you know i think that's the that's the potential here yeah um and i'd love to maybe echo and emphasize some of what was said here right um you know two kind of aspects have stuck out to me um because there's the aspect of how um you know, the patient, uh, let's say we don't, it, uh, the person who is dying can benefit, let's say from a psychedelic experience uh, on the one hand. And, and that's, um, I think there, we alluded to it here, but you know, there's a lot of studies about this specific topic from Johns Hopkins and other places on um, how psilocybin has helped people who are nearing end of life. Um, and I also think that something you uh, hit on Tony um, and I, others here too, I think is that uh, the importance of and the effect of a provider having a psychedelic experience. Um, and I linked in the chat here, you know, your paper about this, Tony, about how your oh, experience with psilocybin changed how you practice palliative care. And, um, and I think this is a really um, maybe under discussed aspect to it. It kind of relates to this whole medicalization, medical paradigm of, you know, medicalization of death. Um, Cause we're trying to, you know, even this using psilocybin for end of life, you know, we still are engaging with it in this sort of what I would call a, a narrow paradigm, right? The idea is, oh, you give the patient the medicine and that's going to help them with their depression leading to death. Um, yeah. And it's, there isn't as much research there about that's like- doctors we, know, that's our treatment paradigm, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I want to see the research on, well, what about, how does the effect of your doctor's experience with a psychedelic your palliative care doctors experience and nurses, how does that affect how you engage with death or yes. your, or your, your death doula or death midwife, you know, what other, you know, um, yeah, well, I, I would love well, to hear more comments on that. Well, you know, can I say, I mean, Mike, the one thing I would just say is the reason I think one of the reasons you don't hear more about this from the physician side is that, uh, like physicians and nurses are worried about, um, doing things and talking that are illegal and talking about them publicly and you know one of the reasons i wrote that article and published it in a medical journal was because i felt like there were no physician narratives out there about what what the real difference is and you know this is the tip of the iceberg i think and the edge of the wedge of change i think of this as the beginning of social changes you know how do we tell the stories that will create the new mental models for everyone about what this could be like. And, and one of the disruptions of mental models that I think would be really important is disrupting the idea that, you know, you're the patient, you're the treater, like, could we create a field that holds everybody and holds, you know, the family, the, the clinicians involved, 
Um, you know, one of the things that really touches me about the COVID thing now is the involvement, the, the involvement that we now see of people who were previously completely ignored, the people who clean the rooms, the people who bring in the food. You know, when I'm in the hospital, my patients all know those people by name, right? Like they've been talking to them and they are part of the field that we are creating and that they, that they um, are being treated within. And we got to pay more attention to that. Yeah, and it's kind of, you know, the person dying isn't the only person affected by death, right? A case in point, right? You know, uh, in my own case, personally, right now, in my community, we're all affected by these deaths. And um, so, yeah, I mean, how can psychedelics affect uh, psychedelic use by the not just the person dying, but the broader, yeah. not only the, of the people, um, the caretakers, but also the people who are grieving and broader community, mm -hmm. you know, how can psychedelics uh, on by all of these folks affected and involved change things with how we relate to death. That's right. Well, you know, death is a so death is a social event, right? Like that is what COVID is teaching us. Death is not just an individual event. Death is a social event. And so when, um, for example, you dedicated this session to your friend and, you know, jester as you as you told me about and and said yes, that you John were wear, was certainly a jester <laughs> wear a hat that was like th that is bringing his like mojo right into the space to infuse this discussion with um all the you know wit and humor and um what other other whatever other kind of comments he would have made here um and, and you know it enlarges us all right like it 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 makes us all take a different stance towards what's what's happening. And so instead of having death as an unseen, unspeakable, hidden event that actually leads to a great deal of um, harm, it leads to, um, you know, morbidity, um, you know, self-destructive behaviors, um, addictions, I mean, real, I mean, other deaths, right? Like real harms. And, and I think that is one of the things that we could change by changing the culture of, of how people die and how people are held by all of us when they're, when they're in that phase of life and what happens to them afterwards, like how, how we hold their memories and hold their presence. Um, it seems like that it would start with also not separating death from this thing that we have to address you know i mean i feel like even in this this year with the coronavirus you know we're we're addressing death we're we're, tr we're trying to get away from death again we're always on the run from death and i even feel like in this conversation with psychedelics it's just another way for everybody for us to just tackle death can we just somehow tackle death and make it better for these people or easier there or somehow it's gonna and it's like oh yeah if, if somehow I, I i my hope is that because psychedelics are so expansive that we get out of that back and forth these little boxes of no we're going over here no we're going over there and we're just everywhere sometimes people are dying and sometimes they're not dying sometimes they have yes. a good death sometimes they have a horrible death that this idea that we need to control every death Millions of people are not going to be interested in psychedelics and their dying experience will be just yes. absolutely fine. And so, again, that we're not ramming down people's throats that, oh, here's the answer. If only everybody would just take psychedelics, you yes. know, because that would actually be horrifying, um, and, you know, in, in many ways, because yeah. who knows what. But again, I, just, I, I feel like there's such a need to always have an answer yes. and to make everything okay. And I'm, I'm of that rare breed that I don't, believe it's a right to have a comfortable death. I, I'm not sure where that even came from. I think it's a beautiful opportunity. It's a wonderful thing that happens for many people. But for many people, it doesn't happen. And I don't want to go to sleep at night thinking that all of these horrible things happened to them because they didn't get the right dose of yes. morphine and the right lemon cake and all of these things yeah. didn't happen. I mean. We, we just can't be going into this saying that we're going to use psilocybin because it's going to fix everybody's dying experience, right? Like that is like, and, and you know, Maria, I know that you have done so much work in like the historical use of these things. And I'm curious about what that tells you, you know, how that could inform our contemporary discussion better. Well, I think that's one of the great areas that we really don't um, understand very well. And uh, um, I think 
the 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 plurality of people who are getting interested in the potential that psychedelics have for affecting these very um, significant and transformative life experiences is disconnected from the traditional uses. And also, you know, once again, I hearken back to the midwifery model. When the, the, the changes were beginning to happen in the environment of obstetrics, the place that they came from was an underground group of non, they, they were described as lay midwives, although that's a term I don't like to use because it, it kind of assumes that there's a profession that they're not members of. Um, but they were willing to go to jail so that women could have the birth experience that they wanted. Not that they could have a particular experience, but they could have the one that they wanted for themselves. And I think that there's wisdom in that kind of outside the box uh, practice that we haven't tapped in the current um, explosion of interest in this area. And, and I want that to happen, but I want it to happen in a very safe and thoughtful way because I'm old enough and I've been involved in this sphere of interest long enough to have seen what the, um, you know, sort of crazy level of popularization that happened 50 years ago did to the, um, the larger community's understanding of what psychedelics might be yeah. and what they could be used for. So there's a, there's a mixture there of trying to not, you know, I think spiritual evolution and all, um, personal and, and spiritual growth, the creator intends for it to be economical. You know, you're not supposed to waste. And there's a big body of experience and knowledge that we're not actually tapping into yes, right now. I think that's so, uh, so right. I mean, one of the, there's just an interesting comment in the, in the thread from Nathan about, you know, um, and, uh, w wanting to hear about entheogenic ceremony that includes a dying person and his loved ones. And someone earlier had asked about, you know, family members, what about every, the family taking everything at the same time? And, and you know, I, I will tell you, I have not seen like entheogenic ceremonies right, like right at the moment of death, like the Aldous Huxley thing about being, you know, getting the big dose of, you know, whatever LSD or whatever, right, right as they're going out. But what I have seen are people who, have had, or patients or family members um, who have had um, experience with psychedelics. And what they have done is basically ceremonialize the end of their lives. And so they're not necessarily tripping. They're not, that, that, that is not the time, that, that isn't the time for them to like take this journey. They take the journey and then they're present for the end. And, and that, that presence allows them to create the kind of ceremony that um, uh, actually gives everybody a place that does brings a kind of justice and a kind of closure to the end of their lives. And it may not be perfect, you know, like as Lady Bird is saying, you know, we all have plans and, you know, they all don't turn out. But actually, I think it's that ritualizing intent that creates such a different feel for what those deaths are like. Um, the sense that, you know, we actually are all always participating in the ceremony here. Um. And maybe also the softening, you know, we talked earlier about that loosening of those, you know, the stickiness. Like I think about there's the, the beauty of being able to create ceremony and have, and have that sacredness at the end of your life. And then also what happens to the whole culture as we all embark on this journey together and all of these ways that we have of controlling things start to loosen and soften. And so the, the entire conversation around death and dying moves away from how do I control this experience to how am I living in my body as an integrated being with things living and dying all around me all the time. And, and that, it's just a huge shift you know we're still in the the conversation around control and managing and performing and presenting and even this conversation you know, like what are the stories we have oh i know somebody who did this or this was what that death looked like and it's still about um presentation and i feel like we're moving into experiential moving away from the experts you know the doulas and the midwives are guiding, and yet what we always say is you actually are doing it yourself, right? We always are making space for the person to have their own experience. And psychedelics is so great. And so on that, I do know of a couple of people who know that they're dying and have asked to journey with friends and then have a guide with that. And so it's not quite a journey at the end of life, but their end of life is coming. 
and they've requested certain friends to be with them for some time with the medicine and they all do that together and then yeah. come back. And so that's a, it's like a step towards it, Very which beautiful. allows people to experience that with them and yeah. not be at the actual, you know, yeah. down moment. I, I, I mean, I think what you're raising Lady Bird, which I think is so interesting is like, when is the right time to do the, when is the right time to do the journey if, if you are really facing, you know, your own mortality? Like I could imagine a whole bunch of different iterations that might have different uses. Like there might be a place for the journey that's pretty upstream for someone who's incredibly fearful, right? There might be a place for a journey that's very near the end, the actual end of life for someone who gets there and realizes, oh my God, I have all this, I have this unfinished stuff and I, I just can't get it all done. Right. I and I, I feel like in the in the expertise that that I think is in the community out there, to be honest, and that we can bring into the medical sphere, because that's where dying happens now a lot, as it is the province of doctors and nurses and families, um, is more um more choices and more subtle thinking about how that could happen and when is the time for the journey and what's the work that journey could do and you know somebody notes there about you know we're grasping culture and we're worried about pain and you know like and we are and so how can we use what we've been given by our culture and and approach psychedelics as a different kind of modality that works through giving us an experience an, a different kind of experience not by just fixing something or saying oh you'll you're, you're going to take the psychedelics and let go of that it's 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 actually way more complicated and way more beautiful really yeah way more beautiful i love that it makes me think about just life right i mean i mean i guess i feel like fear is actually great you know i mean i get nervous before I do things before I'm sitting with a patient sometimes, or I have to go and go towards something. The fear isn't necessarily a negative thing. And I, I don't even know that everyone needs to focus on erasing fear. You know, yeah. I think I just, I mean, I probably, I'm just parroting the same thing, but I really feel like it's about having fear and joy, fear and curiosity, fear and something else that it's that you're not just dominated by that one thing but you know if somebody as they're getting ready to die all of a sudden has some fear i don't know that that's a horrible thing if there's other things also there you right. know and so we don't need to erase or i, I guess i say we i would like to not erase um fear i want to be able to expand beyond that Maria. Well, there's also this, you know, th this is a tremendous opportunity for that kind of change to take place because of the pandemic and the, and, you know, I, I once again, I, I was working in the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic when they were first trying to figure out why all these gay men had this gay bowel syndrome that we didn't know what it was. They had this intractable diarrhea and it wouldn't go away. And then they had generalized lymphadenopathy and we didn't know what that was. And then pretty soon I was going to a funeral every week. And for people who were contemporaries of mine, who were sort of starting out as healthcare providers, that was a lot of dying. You know, yes. the, the, the dying that people expected to experience was largely of people who were older and sicker. And these were people who were young and similar to them. And it really changed a lot of people's ideas about what their function was and what their, what their capabilities were as a healthcare provider. And um, I'm just wondering, like, it, we can take this, the, the, one of the things that's gotten us into the, the, the place that we are now is the way that death kind of got away from the family. You know, it used to be that people died at home. They usually died of pretty short-term kinds of problems. That's one of the reasons well, pneumonia, the old man's friend, because people would become frail and then they would get pneumonia and it would kind of finish them off and not too, it wouldn't take too long to do that. And yeah. then somebody from their family would build their coffin and somebody would wash the body and somebody would wrap them in the winding sheet and somebody from, would dig the grave. And those were all family things. Yes. Whereas now death happens out there. It happens in the hospital or in, a, in an environment that's managed by professionals or worse, it happens on the television. It's some terrible catastrophe that happens in a motor vehicle crash or so because yeah. of somebody's terrible behavior. And it's just made death such a stranger. Yes. And we have now got the opportunity to renew that kind of familiarity and, dare I say it, friendship with death. Yeah, 
No, I think you're I see you're so right, Maria. I mean, my worry about the current situation is like we're kind of, we've kind of outsourced everything, right? Like we're we've outsourced death and we're outsourcing we're outsourcing death care. And and you know, one of the things I saw in the HIV epidemic is there were these beautiful openings towards death and um the the development of these, you know grassroots hospices and ways to care for people when like nobody else wanted to care for them. And then there was this other reaction about like, oh my God, we've got to get way, way, way away from this. And and I see kind of both things happening now in, in the area of COVID, like is the, oh my God, we've got to get a long ways away from this and run as far as we can and make it as distant as we can and outsource as, as much as we can. And then there are the people who are, um, in the middle of it, they're they're fa they're facing it, I, and there a lot of them are nurses, to be honest, because the nurses are the only ones left and allowed to be at the bedside, and they are facing it, you know, in the absence of the the kind of community support that anybody needs to like be so close in this intense space, and and I am really really concerned about the the um the what's going to happen to all those clinicians like right now, because they're like getting hung out to dry. And I am really worried about them. I actually would love to do a study for um, doctors and nurses with COVID related distress and trauma, you know, psilocybin, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, because honestly, I think there's going to be just this huge morbidity, this wake of morbidity that, that follows. And, and, um, I think it could be a test case for, for what we're doing with these medicines and this new kind of therapy. Well, I think there's gonna be a tremendous demand because there already are studies that really demonstrate that psychedelics can help people with PTSD, yeah. which is otherwise <clears throat> a pretty intractable diagnosis. And um, I, this, this gives me a lot of um, buoyancy about the legal process that it's not going to get interfered with by somebody because there's going to be a tr huge groundswell of people who are demanding these treatments i'm sure there's a there's a good case for their utility and people are going to force the law to change it's that, that's well, a matter I, of time I, I hope so like if the law could serve us and so, right like that would that would be maybe what's supposed to happen but and and you know i do have some anecdotal stories of um, physician, a couple of anecdotal stories of physicians who were like overwhelmed with their COVID experiences in some of the early surge hosp hospitals who've had, you know, transformative experiences um, with a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, not done under above ground research. So I want to be careful about that because I feel like one of the struggles that we have right now is how do we bring this into the above ground space fast enough so that everybody just doesn't go use them in a way that we won't be able to learn what what happens we won't be able to learn what really works um you know we won't be able to assure that there's really quality and and um you know the real the real grace and um beautiful expertise of the therapists who are really capable out there mm. Yeah, it was really rich. Um, you know, I, I think this point about all the trauma of COVID um, and psychedelics potentially playing a role in that is really interesting. And I, I also think it potentially ties into, you know, we talked about um, the HIV uh, epidemic as it was coming onto the scene. And um, another thread I want to tie in here um, is, you know, Brian Anderson was doing a study at UCSF on psilocybin group therapy yeah. for long-term survivors. Yeah. Um, so people who, um, you know, I think primarily gay men who were seeing their peers uh, die and who survived. And now here we are decades later um, and, you know, people are still experiencing effects of this uh, traumatic event. And yes. Cause, cause learning is time does not necessarily heal. Right, like these are gay men, my my generation, who like all of a sudden all their their friends like would be dropping, and they would be going to more than one funeral a week, and they lose their whole peer, they, you know, they lost their whole peer group, and and now decades later, they're still trying to get over it, right? Because it's that traumatic, 
And, um, you know, and then there was this whole stigma around it that, that I think actually led, you know, added this more complicated layer. You know, it's called disenfranchised grief by the grief professionals. Um, and so I think that study that um, Brian did, which is super interesting to me, right? Like this old, old trauma and grief and this, you know, demoralization that is still alive. I mean, the fact is that those things are tractable. Those are patterns in our brains that are little circuits that got baked in there that we're stuck in. And psychedelics could help loosen all that up. Right. And, and so I feel like there's tremendous potential in that. And then the other piece about that is that, you know, the group integration they did, which was, you know, having all these guys talk to each other about their experiences and about, you know, their experiences with the psychedelic. I mean, it sounds like talking to those researchers that that was a very important part of that intervention. And it speaks to the role of, you know, a healing community or a community that helps hold these really intense experiences. I mean, that that same observation has been made about veterans who have PTSD, like that the role of the healing community. And um, I, I do think there's a way we need to think about creating those communities around people who are ill instead of just, you know, trying to diagnose them and fix them. You know, Lady Bird, you're going to say something. Yeah, or that they have to do that on, like you're saying, this community element of it that, you know, survivors are on their own with their families. And uh, yeah, you just do it yourself and you find your healing pathway and you go to your counselor, you do what you need to do to heal, but don't bring it out into the rest of the world. And right. that rippling effect, you know, we talk about that with the Humane Prison Hospice Project that <clears throat> allowing a prisoner to care for another dying prisoner in the cell. Yes. They're, they're not bringing psychedelics in there to be sure, but that ripple effect of being seen and cared for, of being able to see and care for somebody else, the correctional officers seeing that happening. Now these prisoners yes. are human beings. That correctional officer goes home to his family having interacted with a deeper part of humanity. And so when anyone is on that healing pathway with psychedelics and they get to unpeel back those earlier wounds that have been informing them. Those wounds yes. have actually been creating communities. We've created culture and structure out of unhealed wounds. That that impacts everybody. It doesn't yes. just impact the person who had the wound. So everyone in their environment is now getting a piece of healing That's because right. of that healing happening. So it's so not just about the one person. It's, yeah. you know, beyond, it's the seven generations after, it's the seven generations that were before because healing that my father gets to experience impacts me. Yeah. Right, it goes all directions. And it's, yeah. Well, I think that's such, a, I just want to call out that that, that that web of interactions that you have created with the hospice prison project, I think is one of the huge achievements of that work, um, Lady Bird, that you should be really proud of. Because, you know, when I saw the pictures the first time of those guys taking care of each other in prison, like I was in tears and, and it like rehumanized them for me. Just like even in my, like even as a casual observer who doesn't know anything about the prisons, right? There's a deep, deep lesson in that for us. Right. And so, and they don't need psychedelics to have that expansiveness, right? But I imagine that my openness to that allows me to bring in that to that field, right? So right. again, we're not saying, oh, now everybody has to, in order to experience that, it's like, no, if the field, there's enough, there's enough of it in the field, it will spread. Right. You were the catalyst in a certain way, right? I, I really appreciate all, uh, all this, like, about the importance of the community and how we all are, of course, we're all interconnected, right? And um, and this is a lot of what Brian does speak about. I left the link in the chat here to Brian's talk from the yeah. psychedelic conference. Um, and that was a big part of it is how this group therapy aspect to it, because it uh, there was community healing that happened. And this is something I wrote about a, uh, last year as well for Double Blind um, about, yeah, this isn't just we're not going to fix the problems, uh, the systemic issues that we are all experiencing and culturally, systemically, right, by treating all of the incidents of trauma, depression, um, as just uh, individuals that are in a vacuum that need to be cured and right. or face their existential crises on their own. But it's cultural work, it's systemic work. And this is something that is done communally. And um, 
and yeah, these is how the person dying or somebody with them can, who's had informed with this experience, or you must get a critical mass of people that have had psychedelic informed experience and that can shift the cultural view. Um, well, that's a big hypothesis, right? Because like it puts out there that maybe there's some kind of healing that is possible, right? Like I think that is one of the stunning things from those, the documentation from that hospice prison project is there is obviously healing going on in many directions there, right? In, in the most unexpected, under-resourced, you know, stigmatized, horrible circumstances, right? I, I, I would, I would veer away from that word unexpected you know again that's that way that we've done this cultural thing like a, a good death only happens here a good death can only happen there yeah it's expected there's they're human beings and they know how to be human and wherever there are humans that, that potential is there and yes um whether yes. we pay attention to it and allow it to exist um and maria i'm really curious what thoughts are percolating for you over there well, I was thinking. I, I was thinking about the, the 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 potential for some disjunction between the person who's dying and the primary caregiver or caregivers for that person, in terms of what that person's death should be like or contain. And I think it's possible for people who are death engaged, and that would be somebody who would be likely to be in the position of being a caregiver, to have some ideas about the good death, which you could, you, you know, you can really try to push that on people also. So yes. I think it's very good that we're having this conversation and <clears throat> people are aware that there's a potential for different kinds of approaches to this universal human phenomenon. But I want to go back to that thing about people, you know, you have to understand who's the star of the movie and who are the supporting players. Yes. You know? And recognize that everybody has their own needs in different mm -hmm. ways. You know, that good death thing has turned out to be such a mm -hmm. trap for hospice, honestly. It's it's been, you know, hospice ended up trying to promise everyone a good death and tried to be tried to like measure and quantify all that stuff. And gosh, I'm not sure how much good that I, I'm not sure if it really got us going in the direction that we really need to go. Because I think what and the lady a good death for whom, you know? I mean, well, right. Well, you know what? So, you know, my teacher, Joan at Halifax, you know, was in a hospice in India and everyone was like super chill. And it turned out and she said, what is going on here? This is I, this is like a miracle place. And it turned out everybody was on like big doses of morphine. Right. Like they were just like, you know, sedated. And 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 you know what? You see the same thing in our hospitals here. You know, people get uncomfortable, they get upset, and everyone's like, whoa, maybe we need more Ativan, maybe we need more morphine. Like, that is the first thing out of everybody's mouth. And we've got to be bigger. Like, we need we need to clone Ladybird, and, like, you know, sprinkle her everywhere. Yeah, that, you, Ladybird, I, there, like, are, there are me's everywhere. I mean, that's just the whole point, is that everybody is me. Everyone is having this thought and this conversation. And <laughs> They just don't always have the time to be on a Zoom call um, or get invited to do this. But I mean, I guess to your point about the the other players in the hospital, Tony, I mean, this is so important to remember. The housekeepers, the people bringing in the food are incredibly skilled at being at the bedside and being human beings. But we mm. somehow have given these roles to certain people. And, you know, I've seen that in the hospice movement where the hospice workers are somehow these these entities it's like no they they actually are just kind of getting addicted to this energetic field and they're showing up all of the time and in some ways we need to back off right yes. it's like it's not about us it's not about the hospice worker it's not about the death doula um and psychedelics for to me opens that field back up it's like oh everyone is here yes Everyone's yes here. thank you for that correction you need to do this Yes. Although I will say I, that now I've started this thing, and now there's somebody in the comments who also wants to clone you. So you might now have that's to close this whole call me and whether my job is complete for me, and I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Okay. Now I've started something. Not not good. Okay. Excuse me. Well, yeah. Now, speaking, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Maria. Speaking of starting something. Um, there's somebody, somebody has asked if we're going to take questions and I, yes. I feel a little overwhelmed to deal with the questions, but 
but I wonder, Mike, if maybe you could help us with some. Well, you beat me to it. That was actually exactly what I was about to start doing. So yes, we're gonna go to questions. So um, folks who are not are new to Crowdcast, um, you'll notice just below our video, there's a button that says, ask a question. So if you haven't seen it yet, that's where you ask a question. So you click the, the button there. And you can also upvote the questions that you want to uh, hear from. So that is because we're not going to have time to answer all. There's 24 questions already. So we're definitely not going to be able to answer all of these, but we're going to go based on the most popular. So uh, starting at the top, I'm going to start answering a question from Sammy. Question is, I'm curious if you can speak on the possibility of over-medicalization of psychedelic use once legality becomes more widespread and what could be done to avoid gatekeeping. Hmm. Hmm. So, Sammy, that's a super good question because, man, we we are really good at medicalizing anything. I can medicalize anything, right? The medical system can hoover up everything in its wake. And I think what it's going to take is I think it is going to take a community of all of us, all of you who are on this broadcast to say, you know, wait, wait, what we're really trying, what we really are trying to get at is this. We're really trying to have this, you know, experience of presence and the, this experience of realness and, and this ability to, you know, relax all the, all the cultural program that we're coming in with, right? Um, and, and so I think it's actually going to take a certain amount of discussion from the people who are clients of both medical systems and psychedelic treatment treatment centers and psychedelic therapists to, to keep their eye on the ball of what's truly important. And I think we need to create a, you know, a, a movement of all of us to, to articulate that and, and, and get it to be clearer and, and, and um, pithier than what I've just said here. Yes. Maria, what do you think? I think there's a demand that um, is sort of part of the zeitgeist of the moment that yes. the 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 world be more respectful of knowledges and practices and experiences and histories that don't come from the hegemonic mainstream. And I just think that I, I hope that there are enough really good hearted, intelligent, open minded people to just move out of the way and make space for some of this. Like we, we, when we acknowledged Kalindi, for example, at the beginning of this meeting, yeah. I wonder if the several hundred people who are on this call, how many of them actually know anything about his work or his community. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yet he was a major master. And um, it, so we, just, we, have to, we have to open our eyes and shut our mouths, basically. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> I think you're so right. Mm. Did you have anything you want to add, Ladybird, to that? Or no? Okay, we can hop to the next one. So thank you, Sammy. Our next question is from Eric. So Eric asks: Any concern about big pharma and insurance getting involved in psychedelic medicines? Well, of course, Eric, because, you know, just the way we can uh, medicalize everything, they can commoditize anything, right? And so, you know, the, the model that we have of mental health care that is big pharma creating these super expensive medicines that people are supposed to take forever, like that is like that, you know, I think everyone, even in the medical field feels, is beginning to feel quite uncomfortable of that as a paradigm for, um, for healing. And, and so I think we are going to have to be um, creative and vigilant about um, creating new models of care and, and actually new business models. I think I am hoping some of the entrepreneurs who are socially conscious can come up with new models of care and new models of of making these medications available in ways that are, you know, responsible and um, expertly handled. Um, and, and I am seeing a huge amount of that dialogue in the field. And so actually all the fact that it's not 
you know, finished yet, that actually doesn't bother me because I think we're kind of in this kind of chaotic formation period. And so what it takes is for all of us to, um, you know, put our, you know, give our support to the, to the experiments and the innovations that look really promising. And it's going to be tough because, you know, there's a big pathway out there for that stuff. I don't know, Lady Bird or Maria, what do you guys think? Well, I, I think I agree with what you're saying and maybe to Maria's point way back about, you know, midwifing and, and birthing that I think this is always going to be this ebb and flow of some folks wanting to take control over things and other people not. And if nothing from the last four years has, you know, kind of imprinted on me is to not hand it over to government or expect any, so pharma does one thing, okay, pharma can just go ahead and do that. And I'm going to focus over here with this other community and really kind of at the same time be building something else. So, you know, it's, I, I hope that there will be both things happening again, that we're not just then putting all of our attention on trying to prevent um, and really keeping that clear pathway to this is, the, you know, the good and true and beautiful way this work can happen and just keep kind of our eye on that. And yes, the warriors will get out there and fight the good fight. Hopefully that will keep happening as well. But I think, um, again, that polarization and sometimes then the, the good work gets lost because we're busy trying to fight people from yeah. taking over it. And they're gonna, it's already been taken over probably, so we don't have to worry about it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I see concerns in the comments about, you know, the licensure and different kinds of restrictions on, on who, who can practice in different ways and legislation. And I, I, I totally acknowledge those are, you know, uh, not always helpful and um, not always the best. And, and yet I feel like we want to make ways for the people who want to access this kind of care um, safe and high quality. Because honestly, my patients with advanced cancer, like they, they can't, they're not, they don't have the energy to shop around. And if they did, I wouldn't want them to spend all their energy, you know, going to find an underground guide that I don't know. Like I want to be able to send them to somebody I trust where I know they'll have a good experience, where I know that there's somebody who's well-trained, right? And not um, just for the elite, right? Yeah. I mean, what about all of the people that are- Yeah. I want to don't I, have the access to the fancy doctors or anybody that's even open-minded to this type of yeah. well, care speaking to the elite. And some of them don't even want a fancy doctor. They would be, they want someone who's like me, right? They want like a regular person, right? They want a regular person who has some extra knowledge and extra experience. And, and you know, I think that's what we are, we've got to create. Right. Marie. Well, this is one of the few really upbeat observations that I can make about the pandemic is it's forcing us to this point, you know, like, um, people, I think it's desirable for people to have some training. Um, you can, you can kind of see that there are certain kinds of practices that work better for people, but you want to proliferate those trained people as quickly as possible and get them into the communities where people need care. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous power struggle in medicine about who gets to occupy which territory. Mm -hmm. And, um, that, that structure may just break down because of all the stress that it's experiencing right now. Well, you know? right. Like, I mean, I, as a doctor, I can say that, you know, like we are the cause of a lot of that, like my profession. And, and yet if there is this overwhelming thing that is happening, that might open up the field for exactly. other qualified people to provide service to people who really need it, right? You know, as a nurse practitioner, like California is one of the few places where nurse practitioners can't practice independently. And why do you imagine that is, <laughs> you know, it, it's because it's a desirable place to live and work and mm -hmm. it's been defended vigorously by the medical profession against the in, in, incursion of nurse practitioners who are cheaper to train. And most of the time, if your kid needs their ear looked in, that's a perfectly fine person to have you see them. And also a lot of other more complicated things. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Claudia points us out as a, a column. I'm just curious what you guys, what you think about this element of how the access and who's getting access to it and which communities, you know, when we talk about medical training and training for using these medicines, 
I think about like where I was born in Cook County, Chicago, you know, I, I doubt that it's, this has happened, this conversation, I don't know, but I wonder if conversations like this are happening in medical communities or hospices yeah. in really marginalized areas. And what, what are your thoughts on that? Not having well, it just be fancy. Yeah. Well, I mean, here's what I can say, and this is kind of a problem that my profession has created is that um, when I am interviewing, you know, people of color about how they feel about serious illness care, not just not in, you know, in the age of COVID, they're like, uh, we don't feel like we've gotten the care we need for like the basic care. And so when it comes to palliative care or end of life care, we feel like, you know, hospice is like getting offered the booby prize when you didn't get what you really needed earlier right? That's the rock that we have to figure out how to deal with, because actually it's, it's a, it's a barrier. And it, and, you know, people of color are not, don't have access and, and are, are reticent and hesitant to access um, kinds of care that actually, uh, I, I think we could disseminate more, but we also aren't, you know, making it available in the kinds of structures and places that really feel safe and comfortable to them. And I think that's one of the other things where we have not, you know, not done such a great job. Well, we're constrained by the, the statutory environment that everybody who has a license has to function in. But I think there are a lot of, you know, like the, 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 the training program, the, the training program right now that has trained several hundred uh, therapists, including you, Tony, um, has really got it, you know, it's got right in the face of how are we going to expand this practice to people who are not necessarily um, uh, uh, graduate level credential people. Yeah. But, but we have to deal with the regulatory environment. What we don't want is to create a tremendous backlash that will close the whole thing down. Now, if I step aside from that and I don't have to think about that stuff, I would think well, who would you want to be with you when you have this kind of intensely transformative experience? If you're a veteran who has PTSD, maybe you'd want another vet to be with you. You know, if you're a person who's experienced some kind of sex, sexual trauma, you might want somebody who doesn't remind you of the person who traumatized you to be there with you. You know, those are, those are, um, they're so obvious, but you know, I have, I, you, you know, you both know, I've talked about the idea that um, we ought to train funeral directors to give people psychedelic experiences as part of their bereavement care. And other people who are trusted members of the community, what, that yes. whatever le level, maybe it's your tennis pro, for heaven's sake. I mean, it's the, it, it, like, this is like saying who gets to have a good death, you know? Remember who's the star of the movie. Yeah. That's the person who gets to decide who should facilitate the experience that they see themselves having or are heading toward or want. Yeah. So, you know, so Lady Bird, I mean, I think the long answer to this is an awfully long answer to your question, but, you know, this this whole issue of how do we make this um, accessible for people who have been underserved and by, by medical care for such a long time, it's it's a it's a big, complicated issue. And um, it and yet it's super important. Right. Because all the all the the. The, the kinds of conditions that psychedelics have so much potential to treat, including, you know, horrible deaths, like they are um, born disproportionately by black and brown people, by poor people, you know, by people with less income, like, you know, the inequality is super, it's super um, prominent. And the good part is it's become much more clear, like, now in my circles, even in doctor circles, everybody gets it. Like the inequality, everyone like goes, Ugh. it's it's actually made ev making everybody uncomfortable. And I think that's actually good. That wasn't true 10 years ago or even five years ago. But this is the thing I was talking about when I said people have to move over because, you know, I'm sorry, I keep using the same frame of reference, but it's the one I'm most familiar with. When midwifery started to resurface as a profession in the United States, a lot of people who had different kinds of training from that said, oh, poorly trained people giving poor care to poor people. Mm. And, you know, you have to be able to produce a really credible, robust, skillful, heartful 
experience for people also. So you can't just, you know, there's a balance there that has to be struck. That's between, right. Between um, shortchanging people because they can't afford something and, and excluding who might be able to give perfectly adequate care. Yes. You know, I think that's such an important point, Maria. We really have to bear that in mind as we watch this unfold. But I'm going to let Mike ask us a different question because otherwise I'll just blab on and on. <laughs> well, this is a really, it's a really good question. And I actually, I'll add a couple of thoughts as well. Um, you know, you, it was mentioned, but we need new models for business. And I'll just sort of uh, give a, uh, a preview, if you will. Some folks may have seen me hint at this already on our email list or Discord channel, but there will be, uh, I'm currently working on producing an entire series on psychedelic economics that's going to get into all of the all of this um these aspects right of like the capital entering and the profit motives and psychedelic startups and um what are the problems with that how can we do better uh it's going to be so we're going to have a whole series of events dedicated to that topic on psychedelic called psychedelic economics that'll be early 2021 so stay tuned for that make sure you're on the psych stems email list and looked at way 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 more into it um the other thing i would like to note as well um on this question is, you know, the issue isn't, and to, as I understand it, the issue isn't that medicalization is inherently bad, but so, so much as that it can't be the exclusive modality by which we have access to these experiences. There have to, so some people do want to do a psychedelic with a doctor and do feel safer. And that's great and for that reason, like the FDA trials and everything. Um, that's awesome um, to the extent that it's done in an accessible way. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, we, need, we also need in parallel to FDA approval, we need a much broader decriminalization of all drugs. We need to end the drug war, period and not just possession. Also for people that are facilitating right. uh, for the drug sellers. And, um, you know, that's a conversation we're hopefully getting closer and closer to. Oregon um, is kind of pushing that forward right yeah. now. But that's something I, I, I can't, I can't, mm -hmm. I can't be incomplete without noting that. <laughs> no, uh, you're right. And and you know what, the, the signs of change are in the, are in the air. Like I was on a phone call with the city attorney of the city of Seattle today, and he was all over this and I was stunned, frankly. And he was like, I am tired of doing this drug war thing. It's not working. He totally got it. And I think that's becoming more and more evident. And um, even Joe Biden, who's one of the architects of modern drug war policies, um, is has admitted uh, that he's made mistakes and has actually, and I'm writing an article about this with uh, Annie Oak at Lucid News, uh, covering how Biden himself has changed his position mm -hmm. on drug policy nice. and has made commitments to make real reform. So yeah, look out for that in Lucid News. Shout out, Annie. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, we'll move on to our next question now. Um, some tangents, but I think important ones. Um, all right, so the next question uh, from Martha. Martha asks, can you talk about working with oncology and other allopathic physicians and helping them to embrace psychedelic and palliative support? I had to seek out these supports in secret from my cancer care providers. Yeah. Um, well, Martha, good on you for like not just saying, not just believing them and, and saying no and not doing that. And I think there is a culture change that can happen in um, even regular oncology and in regular medicine. And I think this, you know, conversations like this are the beginning of it, right? Because culture change is possible in mainstream medicine. You know, Maria's talked about it with midwives and birth. I've seen it related to the development and the institutionalization of palliative care. And actually it's a good, it's been a good thing. And, and I think, there is a hunger out there in the medical provider community for ways to deal with problems that they find, um, you know, deflating and disturbing um, and, and situations where they don't even feel like they're doing a good job. And, and I think um, what we need then are we need credible treatments that do get studied in a credible way for them, like, you know, have clear scientific evidence and, and practitioners that they meet and work with who are obviously qualified and obviously skilled. And, and that is what I've seen change the culture in palliative care more than anything else, is oncologists who work with a skilled 
palliative care nurse or social worker or nurse practitioner or doctor, and they go, oh, whoa, my patient really is doing better. Like, I didn't know to do that, right? Like, so there is this culture change that is possible, and it takes a while. I don't know, Maria, what's your observation been in your, your side of this? Um, the rock will wear away, you know, um, the, like the, the, if, if there's, if, if there's anything that persuades me that that's true, it's that we have come to re return to a capacity to appreciate the usefulness and significance of the experiences that psychedelic substances can provoke hmm. in my lifetime. Hmm. And the level of reprehension that was directed at that, at the time that I first found out about it. I would have never bet that we would get another chance and we're getting one. Interesting. Yeah. Super cool. And I'll add having more palliative care doctors, for example, coming out of the psychedelic closet is certainly helpful to that cause. Doctors and nurses and uh, all providers of end of life care coming out of the psychedelic closet um, about our, you know, their own experiences is going to move this forward. Uh, That's so, right. um, so I want to appreciate that as well. Um, and, uh, uh, any other comments, uh, Lady Bird, did you have any? Okay, cool. So we'll move on. Thanks for that question, Martha. Next question is, could psychedelics be used for the hospice care of children? Hmm. Whoa. I think it's a slam dunk to say psychedelics could be used for the hospice care of parents. Parents, right. So... This is where I think, this is one of those places where I think some real research is really needed. Like, I, I actually don't know that the answer for that one is out there, right? Like, I think we're going to have to figure out how to study this and how to do it in a, in a, you know, in a safe and responsible way so we can figure out what the true usefulness is here. Um, but I will tell you, my experience with, you know, those pediatric, you know, really sick kids is, like it is the parents who are just wrenched and you know the kids are mirroring it right like there is a reason that the kids you know they 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 die when the parents have left the room to go to the bathroom or take a shower finally so yeah i think i agree with both of you 100 percent. i think that this is where you expand beyond the actual person who's dying to how yeah. do you create an environment that is expansive for that person to then yeah. rest in that field, right? The child yeah. requires us to create that environment for them. Yeah. Um, and they will respond to that, I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, Without someone. Whole, you know. Yeah. I mean, someone points out in the comments kids get riddled in tons of other drugs. Why not psychedelics? Well, it's not like we're so crazy. Like, yeah. I mean, I is the that riddle? The question isn't so much could they tolerate or would it be beneficial, but like you weigh like what is what are you actually what's your intention? Yeah. And and psychedelics, my experience with psychedelics as an adult, I mean even as maybe a teenager, but was that I had a capacity to process even what was not seeming to make sense to me. And to be able to trust somebody coming across for me to do that. And I don't know that a child needs to have that kind of expansive experience but it would be interesting like you said there's no research or studies about it but again it's about well what is the actual need is the need for the child to have that or is the need for the people around them and, to be and, able to be more comfortable so that they can respond to what the child is actually yeah asking. and if we need to intervene with psychedelics where what is the safest least intrusive easiest to access way that we could design that would make it eventually available to the most people Hmm. Yeah, thanks. It's funny, you read a question, but I'm thinking about the psychedelics for the staff because we always joke in hospice that, you know, one out of N for the patient, three out of N for everybody else in the family in the room. Like, but it never happens that way because you can't legally prescribe that or say that, but right. it's a common thing. That sometimes they need it more than the person who's actually dying. Oh, yeah. Yeah, really good. Well, there's also a body of research that says that people who are cared for by people who have higher levels of death anxiety are spend longer times in the time in the hospital. So 
that means that their caregivers are more likely to either perform or insist on some kind of heroic treatment if they themselves are anxious about death. Totally. Well, and ask any ICU nurse, right? They see it in spades. And I think I'm seeing another question too about the children. I think the other concern that I have is not so much that you wouldn't that it wouldn't be necessarily the right thing for them, but it then goes back to the guides, like Maria and Tony have both spoken to, the training of the person who's holding the space for them. If you're going to offer a medicine that is going to alter a child's experience, we know doctors and nurses know what Ritalin does. We know what morphine does. We know in some ways how to work with those modalities. So the person that is giving that medicine, it's it's so important that they actually know what they're doing um, because well, things don't just go beautifully. Well, it's also, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not the, the expert on ketamine, but I'm sure there are people who are listening that might be. But even when ketamine stopped being used, you know, when I, when I, years ago, ketamine used to be an emergency department anesthetic and people used it a lot because it didn't depress your gag reflex. And so you did, if you didn't know when somebody ate, you wouldn't be taking a chance that they would aspirate. But people didn't like the state and that they can't, you know, the emergency reaction, which is now the thing that people take ketamine for. But they continued using it for kids because kids didn't seem to mind it. You mm. know, the, the, like kids are kind of in an altered state anyway. So somebody needs to do that research and find out like how, what response is, is produced by certain kinds of interventions. But the difficulty is, you know, who's going to sign, how would you get, how would you get permission to do that? Who's going to sign up for that? You know, I mean, you're talking about many years of life that are at, at risk when you're talking about children. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. I have answers to that one. Um, we probably have time for one more question, although I'll add uh, that won't be it. Stay tuned because we, after we wrap up in this room, we also will have a room available for everyone in the audience to engage with each other, kind of like the lobby after the show where you'll have virtual tables that you, where you can choose to sit and speak with your peers using a platform called AirMeet. And we'll speak more about that in a moment. So stay tuned. Um, but in the meanwhile, we'll ask, um, probably our last question here. And um, this question is from uh, Lori. How do you suggest someone get involved in medical psychedelic therapy in today's healthcare world? For the record, I'm a nursing student who plans to work as a nurse and then later become a, a psych NP. Thank you. Oh. Maria, wanted, do you wanna do that one first since you're, the, you're a nurse practitioner? I am a nurse educator times 20 years. I'm a professor emerita of nursing. <laughs> I, I would say the, the simple direct answer is your foot is on the path, keep walking. Yes, you know what, the, 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 and the exact pathway may not be exactly visible now, but it will be by the time you get there. So just keep following the leads because um, the, the, you know, the real training and the real integration of psychedelic uh, medicine into mainstream medicine, it's, it's literally happening as we speak. And so there's a lot of stuff that isn't really quite worked out yet, but it will be. And so it will be out there. Um, uh, as you are getting there. So don't worry that there's not the right exact thing for you now, because I, a lot's going to be happening in the next few years, I think. All right. You know, we'll do, uh, we'll do one more. So our last question is from, uh, Robert, if all goes very well over the next decade and MAPS gets both MDMA and psilocybin approved for use in the USA, uh, actually asterisk, I'll add commentary here. MAPS is not doing the psilocybin research, but, uh, let's say MDMA and psilocybin get approved for use in the USA. What would the best version of how these entheogens psychedelics, uh, make a positive impact in society? What would it look like in 10 years? Ooh. Who would like to go for Lady Bird, like do you I'm want to always, try that I, one? I feel like I'm always going first, so I'm gonna let you guys go first. Maria, go for it. Go for it, um, Maria. Please. You know, we have we have models from history of things that have worked. Um in it there's a sort of startling new book, the the name of which escapes me at the moment, about um uh, uh written by somebody who did some really deep investigation of some archaeological traces of 
of, of uh, potentially psychoactive stuff that had been used in ancient history. But we do know that um, there was a mystery school um, in ancient Greece in which everybody in the community participated. It didn't matter what your social status was. It didn't matter what your gender was. Anybody who had not committed a murder was expected to go through this transformative experience once in their lifetime. So that's my goal and ideal. I have two, actually. That's, that's the sort of big, less reachable one, that there would be centers in every community where without any kind of stigma or, or pressure, people could, when they felt that the time was right for them in their lives, go to have a safe, um, protected experience of an unusual state of consciousness that was, that was sanctioned by the community and recognized as something that people could get benefit from and could volunteer for if they chose to do that. Yeah. Um, the other one is I would like for there to be an endowed chair of psychedelic medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. We could start with event medicine and just sort of cleaning up people who wander off into the bushes because there's there, you know, I, I saw the, the specialty of emergency medicine kind of emerge in medicine during mm. my career. And I can see that this could potentially be a, a legit specialty and it probably should be. Yeah. You know, I'd like to see a pathway for access to psychedelic medicines um, for people with medical issues, right? Like that actually do need to see a medical clinician because they have some kind of significant medical issue. And, and I'd like that those indications to be well-defined and for people to be able to access those medications in, you know, environments that feel like healing environments by clinicians who are really skilled in the biomedical stuff and skilled in the psychedelic stuff or, or have, you know, a collaborative team that can do that. And I'd like to see access to people in the community in different ways. I think there might be community um, centers for, um, medical issues that are that actually function differently than than the what way regular healthcare works now that might be much more accessible and amenable to a whole group of people and then i think this issue of psychedelics for you know betterment of well people right like that phrase i i would love to see something available for that so i i feel like the 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 palette of options and possibilities would be wider that you would be able to um, access high quality, a high quality um, experience with, you know, well-trained people who know what they're doing and medicines that you know what they are and can trust them. And you don't have to worry about like where to find it or going underground, like there's a place for you to go. And you can just focus on actually the experience and what it means for you instead of all this other stuff. I agree with both of you. I don't really think I have too much more to say, actually. I like the endowed chair idea as well. But the, the safety and the access and the broader range that it's, you know, yeah, I don't think I have more to say. Turn on, tune in, take over. <laughs> I'm looking like a true boomer. Okay. <laughs> Our new motto, Maria. <laughs> uh, well, great. I mean, that was actually kind of a pretty perfect closing question. Um, you know, envisioning the future there. Um, I do have uh, a few closing things I'd like to share here. Um, I want to first say thanks to everybody who's uh, who's tuned in here, um, and. Thank you all for being here. We have nearly 700 people that have registered for this event. Um, so thanks for tuning in. Thank you also to everybody who contributed to this event. Um, this is all offered in a gift model. So we um, it's really important for this project that everything we do here uh, is fully accessible to everybody. Um, and we, uh, we just ask you to just pay whatever you want. And those of you who are able, that is really appreciated um, because it does allow us to continue the project. And those who can't, we're also so happy to have you here and participating. So thank you all. And if you are feeling called uh, to help us do more of this, uh, we have a monthly crowdfunder on Patreon. So you can pledge any amount 
as low as $2 a month. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat here. It's patreon.com slash psychsems, P-S-Y-C-H-S-E-M-S. Uh, and if you feel so called, uh, you can make a contribution of any amount. It'll go a long ways. Our website is psychsems.com, P-S-Y-C-H-S-E-M-S. Uh, you can find our previous content. We have a whole library of stuff and we've got more. So if you aren't already, sign up for our, our email list to uh, tune in for our future events. A uh, few extra notes I'd like to make too. There are, um, we will have uh, after this, uh, I'll throw the link in here shortly, an air meet for folks to keep hanging out with each other. There's also a couple events coming up from other organizations this week on the same theme. So if you still want to process more of this, um, Horizons is doing an event premiering a film about psychedelics and death on Thursday. And also the group You're Going to Die is going to have a peer sharing uh, experience on Thursday as well. So I'll throw both of those links uh, onto the chat here. Those are both uh, offerings uh, to continue sort of integrating. Um, and then of course, uh, this isn't, there's more. We're gonna continue hanging out. Um, I will be there to know which of the, which of you all will be able to come to the air meet, uh, but I will, and the folks watching here will, uh, hopefully uh, several of you will come as well. I just threw the link to the air meet into the chat so we can keep hanging out there and I'll get that started uh, once this is wrapped up. Um, I think that is about it. Um, did, any, did any of you have any closing burning remarks that you wanted to make? No, I'm just, I'm so grateful. Thank you for creating this platform and for everyone that took the time to show up. And to me, that it just shows that this, that is actually spreading, that this is actually happening. 700 is a lot. Yes. Um, and the ripple effect is happening. So it's just awesome. Thank you. You are the ripple effect. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. You. Thank you to all three of you for being here. And thank you to Liana too. Uh, for, you know, oh, Liana, thank you. <laughs> Liana, uh, Liana, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you all. Um, so glad you were able to, okay. uh, to do this. I'm really glad we did this event. Um, and thank you everybody who's uh, been watching uh, and also everybody who's transitioned to be with the force and for all of us, may the force be with you all. Bye-bye.